Now, as I was uh, preparing for this session, I did find uh, an, an old video that I made for actually Physics 4B. Um, and <laughs> it has a particular demo that I would like you to see. So, um, so, so that's why this video is here. Uh, let me play a little bit of that now. Now, I want to wrap up this video with a physical demo. Well, a recording of a physical demo. This is a piston for illustrating what we have been talking about. I put in a small piece of cotton. and push it down as far as I can push it down and now I'm going to suddenly compress it see what happens Ignite. Let me try the second time. Another small piece of cotton. Push it down again. And then I'm going to suddenly compress it again. And it ignites again. This is from the increase in temperature of air, from increase in internal energy of air in the piston, from the work done on the gas in the adiabatic compression. It, this, uh, it's one of my favorite demos. It, uh, if uh, we had, I don't know, lab or in-person meeting, it, um, I would <laughs> show that to you in person. It's actually pretty cheap if you want to just buy it from somewhere. I, I think this is an um, Im important thing for someone who's learning thermodynamics to have uh, seen and understood the connection between the mechanical work, which you have seen in chapter four and on, and um, what we describe as uh, thermal energy or internal energy, that there's a direct connection between them. And in fact, the, the, the topic of section sections 9.8 and 9.10, heat engines, it's uh, um, that's the device that uh, connects those two. It, uh, it produces mechanical work from, uh, from thermal energy. Um, so let's see. So let me um, maybe start out with this. Let me start out with the first law. So first law of thermodynamics, it's uh, both uh, what should be actually familiar to you um, at the basic level of concepts. And um, it says something interesting. So one, is um, so it's something that you already know. It says um, so. I mean, so this is the mathematical statement of the first law: that change in internal energy is given by net heat flow, uh, and our sign convention here is a heat flow into the system um, minus the work done by the system. So if the system is doing work on the surrounding, that in our in the physics sign convention it gets counted as positive so you subtract the work done by the system and getting out of that just the uh, definitions of internal energy heat and network what this is saying is that whenever you see a change in, in change in energy that change in energy has to be accounted somehow it change in energy, it could either come from the direct transfer of this particular form of energy, thermal energy or heat or, well, thermal energy, internal energy, or it could come from 
other form way of transferring energy, which is work that you saw in chapter four as a way of transferring energy. So, so if you think about that, that that's what this is saying, that change in energy, it has to be coming from somewhere, then I hope that reminds you of uh, conservation law that you learned in chapter four, conservation of energy. And, and that's really all that first law of thermodynamics is saying, energy is conserved. Um, I, I guess uh, maybe what's uh, new here is that we are starting to account for thermal energy explicitly. I think uh, before um, we were either dealing with the situations where thermal energy didn't play any role, um, situations where mechanical energy was conserved, or um, if uh, it wasn't a situation like that, if we are dealing with the friction and whatnot, um, thermal energy was usually our way of excusing why mechanical energy wasn't conserved. We were just saying, oh, we don't see mechanical energy conserved, but trust us, total energy is conserved. The lost energy just went into thermal energy. Um, that's what we used to do. And with the first law of thermodynamics, we are now explicitly accounting for that thermal energy. Um, so. So that's the new part that we are beginning to account for thermal energy. And what's uh, old, still familiar to you is that this is just a restatement of conservation of energy. It applies the conservation of energy principle. So, um, so it, it, this is uh, um, useful in many different ways. Um, I think the most uh, and the demonstration that you saw of adiabatic compression is an example of that. Um, adiabatic compression is where heat flow is zero. So the work that you're doing on the system, which is a negative work, so minus minus positive change of internal energy, that's what heats up the air. Um, so that's one. But outside of novelty uh, physics demos, or I guess, popular camping tools. Uh, the way it's uh, important to our modern life is its application to heat engines. And I think I might have said this before, chapter nine is quite possibly the single most important chapter in the entire semester at least when it comes to discussion of public policy and public awareness of scientific things that affect people directly. Because many of us might never deal with electric or magnetic stuff or optical stuff, like all those things. Maybe you are in a job where you deal with those or maybe you are in a place where you never have to worry about them. But, um, if you use any form of energy, any form of generated power, uh, that comes from heat engines, or most of them comes from heat engines. So, so the way we cover, um, so like this uh, uh, caption is uh, this, um, kind of summarizing it, beginning with industrial revolution, uh, you know, development of steam engines, uh, humans have harnessed power through use of the first law of thermodynamics. Um, so it, and the electrical power we use today, unless it's coming from solar panels or wind power, um, um, any kind of fossil fuel or nuclear power, at some point in the power generation, they utilize a heat engine because um, a fossil fuel, really the starting place of uh, energy generation is where they just uh, generate uh, thermal energy by burning fossil fuel and nuclear power, the way nuclear reactions are used is to heat up water as a way to uh, as a way to uh, have uh, thermal energy in a controllable form that can be guided to uh, produce mechanical work. So, so in this class, uh, we don't get into quite a bit of that detail. I will show you one demo video that will show you uh, some of that detail. Um, but in terms of description of a heat engine, I think the most uh, useful way to, for us to think of it is more in a schematic way. And this is where uh, first law is applied 
because if you think of a heat engine as a black box, <laughs> you don't know, we don't have to know exactly workings of what's going on in there. But um, what we do account for, what we do take a look at is in the operation of this heat engine, how much heat do we have to provide? How much work are we able to get out of it? And you will find that for operation of any heat engine, there has to be some waste heat expelled. And um, engines operate on a cycle, in a cyclical fashion. So over a whole cycle, it returns to the same state. And that's the reason it says the change in total internal energy over a cycle is zero. And given that, and conservation of energy, the first law of thermodynamics, the amount of work, uh, mechanical energy that can be provided comes from the difference of the heat flow. So, um, yeah, I guess <laughs> it's, it's a schematic description and it's necessarily, um, uh, necessarily uh, abstract schematic. <laughs> I think I've said schematic enough. And this is a, a more concrete um, concrete representation of, uh, of an engine. And I guess uh, this is still somewhat schematic, so it's uh, not specific on, okay, where is this heat input coming from? It depends on the type of engine. Um, so I have a video demo of a Stirling engine. Um, there, the heat input comes from outside. It's just, uh, you know, this piston is hot. That's where the heat is coming from. Uh, a lot of the engine that we are familiar with that, you know, if you drive a car, unless you're driving an all electric vehicle, <laughs> you are driving a heat engine <laughs> or a thing that has a heat engine in it, uh, it uses an internal combustion. So at some point in the engine cycle, there's a thing that sprays in uh, fuel and air mixture, and there's something that ignites that mixture and that ignition provides the heat input. So that heat input provides a rise in temperature, which can uh, provide the necessary pressure that gives the force that pushes this out. That's the power stroke. That's a, that's a, um, that's providing the mechanical work. And so the power stroke pushes that. That's the work done. Now, and oh yeah, and this thing has moved to this farther out position. Now, if uh, this was where we could just uh, stop things, then um, then we could have 100% efficient heat engine. All the heat input here, that would uh, somehow go into the work of pushing this out and you will have 100% efficiency. Uh, but we can't leave things there because we don't have one-time use engines. <laughs> um, we, have to, we have to, we would like to keep using the engine. We can't just uh, throw it out. So this has to come back to the original position. And this coming back to original position involves moving the piston back. And moving the piston back uh, involves uh, doing work on the system. And so there will be some um, so this is the return stroke, I think. Um, so in the the accounting of the overall net work done by the engine, you have to think about how does the uh, engine return to the original position. So in that return stroke, some work gets done. There's a heat that has to be expelled in order to bring here to the original condition. And, and, and then the cycle repeats. That's the um, operation kind of description of engine. Um.